Okay, in our last uh, lesson, we reviewed the incident where Dinah, the, uh, the daughter, uh, Jacob's daughter, was raped, and the ensuing events where Jacob's son went in and, and killed the villagers, uh, um, all the men of the villagers, and you know, took the women and the livestock and all that business. And of course, this episode led to the family moving away from that area back to the land where Jacob, now Israel's father Isaac, lived. Now, it was a time of rededication for Jacob. We, you know, we looked at that uh, last time we were together. Uh, rededication, the things that he did to rededicate himself and his family as they purified themselves and as they headed back to the ancestral home. Now we also looked briefly at Esau's family. Remember there's a whole chapter there, chapter 36, uh, giving all of Esau's uh, family line. And uh, then our lesson ended with Isaac's death and burial with the brothers Esau and Jacob reconciled and together burying their father. Now the next section that we're going to uh, take on here in Genesis will begin with the story of Joseph. Uh, Jacob's uh, son by Rachel, and, uh, the, uh, and he is the bridge, if you wish, uh, that will enable them to travel to Egypt uh, where the book of Genesis will end. So we're kind of turning the corner here. This is the final stretch for this particular study, uh, the final story of uh, the, um, these patriarchs, uh, these ancient uh, uh, patriarchs, uh, and of course the details of how the children of Israel uh, found themselves in the land of Egypt in slavery for many, many years. So we begin um, in Genesis 37, we'll read verse one and two, it says, Now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned in the land of Canaan. These are the records of the generations of Jacob. So now we have a new writer that takes over. The beginning of this chapter marks the end of Jacob's long record of events and the beginning of a new writer. Now, the previous two chapters uh, recording the death of Isaac and the summary of Esau's family end off Jacob's record, and now a new writer, probably Joseph, with the editorial comments of Moses, who was familiar with these events, begins his record. So the first thing he says is that Jacob, like his father, did not see the fulfillment of the land promise, and like his father and his grandfather before him, lived as a stranger in the land that would eventually belong to his descendants. You know, it required great faith. Imagine, you receive a promise from God that the land is yours, and your father receives the promise and then you know, he dies and you have the promise and you die and then the next generation, that promise is still alive, still there. They're still expecting this promise to be fulfilled, but it seems much further away, right? It'll seem much further away uh, when we read about the events taking place with Joseph and how the family ultimately will find themselves uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Egypt. So Joseph was the firstborn of Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel, born to him in his old age. He favored this particular child uh, by giving him um, charge over the flock. So let's read that in verse uh, two. It says, Joseph, when 17 years of age, was pasturing the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their, uh, to their father. Uh, keep on going. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all of his sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a very colored tunic. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers and so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. So as I said, Joseph was the firstborn of Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel. And he favored this particular child by giving him charge over the flock. Now when it says feeding, feeding, it meant not only just giving food, but he was also responsible for the flock, which was a significant part of their livelihood. And as a sign of his authority and favor, Jacob made for Joseph a special coat. Now the Hebrew word used here could mean a color coat or a coat with long sleeves. 
Um, we're not quite sure about that, but either way, the coat symbolized favor. And because of his apparent favoritism, the other brothers who had disappointed their father with much of their previous behavior, as we have seen in the previous chapters, uh, they, they began to hate Joseph as well, uh, to the point where their feelings were open and were vocal. You know, the term son of his old age that we see in verses three and four there could also mean wise son, which would suggest that Joseph was intelligent beyond his years. And of course, later on, don't we see that? He, we saw that he was a good organizer, he was a good administrator, he was a wise, uh, a wise person. So what do we have here? We have, a, we have a young boy who is bright, becoming a father's favorite, and being given extra responsibility because of it, and his brothers hating him for it. And on top of that, uh, you know, uh, whenever they did something bad, he would come back and report it to the father. So if there's a recipe there for family you know, friction, um, there it is. So let's keep reading, verse five, it says, then Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, please listen to this dream which I have had. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf rose up and also stood erect. And behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. Then his brothers said to him, are you actually going to reign over us? Or are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Now, the dream at this point can be simply a product of an overambitious mind, but we do find out later uh, that it was from God and it was eventually fulfilled in Egypt. For the moment, Joseph uses the dream and its significance you know, to kind of rise up uh, above his older brothers uh, you know, and gain their respect. He's the youngest one, he wants their respect. He says, look, I had this dream. You know, in the dream it showed that I was the one. I'm the one that, that rises up. Of course, instead of gaining their respect, it has exactly the opposite effect, and that is that they resent him, resent his words, and begin hating him even more than they did before. Not only was, the, not only was he dad's favorite, not, not only did he kind of tell on us when we're not doing what is right, but now he thinks he's better than we are. He thinks he's going to rule over us because of all of this. So let's keep reading, it says in verse nine, now he had still another dream and related it to his brothers and said, lo, I have had still another dream and behold the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. He related it to his father and to his brothers and his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow ourselves down before you to the ground? His brothers were jealous of him but his father kept the saying in mind. So Joseph's next dream is the same form as the first, but now the entire family is involved, including uh, Leah and, uh, and Jacob. So Jacob, who had known God more intimately than any of his generation, rebukes Joseph for suggesting that he and the others would bow down to, his, uh, to this young son of his. But the next verse says that with time, Jacob began to consider the possibility of this. You know, he kind of kept it in mind. God did work through dreams at that time. You, know, you couldn't discount the idea of dreams. I mean, Jacob himself, right? Didn't he have dreams? Didn't, didn't a lot of the instructions about what he was to do and where he was to go, encouragement to persevere uh, during difficult times, hadn't he received much of this information through dreams? So you know, he wasn't ready to, to discount the dream you know, altogether. And also, Joseph was the youngest and God had chosen him over his older brother. Well, Jacob was the youngest and had been chosen over his uh, elder brother. So there was a precedent there, right? Uh, a precedent in Jacob's mind that the, you know, if God so chooses, the younger can uh, become the ones uh, uh, over the older. Uh, brothers. Um, so it was not a, an unheard of situation, certainly in Jacob's life. And Joseph was obviously more spiritually minded, and as his favorite, he would like to see him blessed by God. So you know, you know, Jacob rebukes him, but in his mind he's thinking, you know, this is not all so crazy here. Because among all my sons, this youngest one that I favor, 
uh, is more spiritually minded, uh, perhaps has a lot of the skills that would require leadership, especially spiritual leadership. So the brothers may have seen the change in Jacob's attitude because now they not only hate him, they begin to envy him as well. This may have been because they uh, suspected that what he dreamt may have been the truth and that God would bless him in some special way over them. Again, we don't know it here, but certainly uh, 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 Jacob um, and the dreams that he had and the direction from God may have been the subject of, of what he shared with his family. Who knows that he didn't talk to his wife, certainly, and his sons about his experiences, his meetings with God, his wrestlings with God, his, his, his visions in his dreams, and so on and so forth. So you know, the whole family is, is sensitized to the idea that God does speak to us in dreams. The younger can ultimately be over the older. You know, these things happen. And so they're you know, kind of sensitive to this idea and now begin to be uh, envious. And so in verse 12 to 14, we read this, the ensuing story. It says, then his brothers went to pasture their father's flock in Shechem. Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers pasturing the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send you to them. And he said to him, I will go. Then he said to him, go now and see about the welfare of your brothers and the welfare of the flock and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron and he came to Shechem. Now, for some reason, the brothers returned to Shechem where they originally massacred that town uh, because that's where they went in and killed all those men in, in Shechem. But they go back to that area to feed their sheep about 50 miles away or so. Jacob was concerned about them because they were in hostile territory, so he sends Joseph to find out if they're okay. We continue reading, it says, a man found him and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, what are you looking for? And he said, I'm looking for my brothers. Please tell me where they are uh, pasturing the flock. Then the man said, they have moved from here for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. So Joseph doesn't find them at Shechem, but learns that they have traveled 20 miles northward to a place called Dothan. Now, uh, try to think of the, you know, what these men are thinking of, you know, their state of mind, if you wish. They're upset and they're in no mood to be around their own home, so they wander to pasture the flocks in further places than usual. Now the word Dotham means two cisterns or two wells. Uh, it was an area that had good water supply and apparently one of the wells was dry because that's where they eventually threw him down. So it's a place of two wells, okay? Just a little anecdote there. In verse 18, it says, when they saw him from a distance and before he came close to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. They said to one another, here comes uh, that dreamer. Now then come and let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits and we will say a wild beast devoured him. Then let us see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben heard this and rescued him out of their hands and said, let us not take his life. Reuben further said to them, shed no blood, throw him into this pit that is in the wilderness, but do not lay hands on him that he might rescue him out of their hands to restore him to his father. And so, uh, uh, um, uh, sin, you know, I, I want to say sin has no age. You know, if you're listening to how they're plotting to um, attack uh, uh, their brothers, you see that sin has no age and no culture. I mean, at least 4,000 years ago, these things take place. This scene is being played out here thousands of years ago. You know, a younger brother's arrogance creates jealousy and resentment and hatred in his brother's hearts. Isn't that familiar? I mean, that's exactly, I can so relate to that feeling, so understand it, and yet it's so far removed culturally from you know, where we live today and how we live today, and yet it's pertinent, is it? It's today, we, all of us can relate to that feeling. And that hatred in the heart eventually turns into murderous intent. You know, Jesus said that if you harbored anger in your heart, you were already guilty uh, in God's court of murdering your brother, because one naturally leads to the other, if not checked. 
Just because you're angry at somebody doesn't mean you're going to kill them, but if you allow that anger to fester and grow and so on and so forth, you know, it'll, it'll lead to something much more, much more violent and much more dangerous. So they don't want to shed his blood because of God's warning against shedding blood. Uh, if they do, it'll be required of them. Uh, I want you to note the kind of legalistic attitude thinking uh, that the way they killed him would get them around God's command. Okay, well, we mustn't shed blood. In other words, we mustn't kill him so that you know, he bleeds because then we'll be liable for his blood. So let's get rid of him in another way where no blood is being shed. I mean, talk about rationalization and denial. You know? This was big in, <laughs> in their minds. And it's big in our minds, isn't it? How many times do we rationalize things that we ought not to do, but we rationalize them? So this is, you know, they didn't know the term rationalization, but this is exactly what they were doing. If we don't spill any of his blood in killing him, then we won't be guilty of his blood. It's interesting also that Reuben, who had acted so badly with his father's concubine, remember he was the one that took his father's concubine, now is showing some leadership in trying to save his brother. You know, he had a lot to gain by Joseph's death because it would guarantee that he, was, he would hold on to his you know, eldest son's position and favor. So I mean, you know, for Reuben, that they would kill him or he would die, that would be a good thing for him. But he was not a man of violence like Simeon and Levi were, so he didn't take part in that plot. So they decide to put him into one of the empty wells to die of starvation. Reuben, of course, saying, OK, sure, let's do that. And his thinking is, we'll do that, we'll move on, I'll circle back, I'll go get him, pull him out of the well, uh, and be able to bring him home. And who knows, maybe Reuben was, was thinking you know, to solidify his position with his father to say, hey, look, I saved him. Go ahead, Joseph, tell dad what happened, and I'm the one that saved you, and so on and so forth. Who knows what he was thinking, but certainly uh, the plot was thickening here. So we keep going with the story. Verse 23, it says, so it came about when Joseph reached his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the very colored tunic uh, that was on him, and they took him and threw him into the pit. Now the pit was empty without any water in it. Then they sat down to eat a meal, and as they raised their eyes and looked, behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Gilead, with their camels bearing aromatic gum and balm and myrrh on the way to bring them down to uh, Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then some Midianite traders passed by, so they pulled him up and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. Thus, they brought Joseph into Egypt. Now, for some reason, Reuben is not present in the next scene as the brothers you know, discuss Joseph's situation further. Uh, a caravan, and notice also, what do they do? They, they decide to kill him, they decide to throw him into the pit, and let him starve to death, and what do they do? They sit down and have a meal after. Talk about cold-hearted, cold-blooded. So what happens next, of course, a caravan comes through, and now Judah, the fourth oldest, proposes a plan that will solve several problems at once. Uh, and that is, why don't we just sell him as a slave uh, to Egypt? First of all, this would avoid killing him and having his blood. See, no blood spilt, because we haven't killed him. Secondly, this would guarantee that no one could rescue him from the well, right? Maybe they suspected Reuben might come back and do this. Maybe Reuben was there and put up a fuss and said, you can't do this, who knows? But if they sold him in slavery and he was gone to Egypt, he was done. And this would also rid them of his influence and presence in their family. And they would also make some money from the deal. On top of that, we make some money. So Reuben is not there. Simeon and Levi are violent men. It is left to Judah to plead for Joseph's life. He couldn't oppose the others by force, so he devises a plan that will do the best considering the circumstances. Now, later on in Genesis uh, chapter 42, verse 21, uh, the Bible says that all the while that these arguments were going on and, and, and the trading was taking place with the Ishmaelites, 
uh, one could hear Joseph pleading with his brothers with an anguished soul to spare his life and not to do this. We find out that that's what was taking place. That's just how cold and how ruthless these men were in selling their brother into slavery. Imagine you are 17 years old and your brothers are debating whether to kill you, let you starve, or sell you into slavery where you will never see your home or family ever again. So they finally sell him for 20 pieces of silver. Uh, interesting to note that later, the price for the dedication of a young boy in the Jewish religion will be fixed at 20 pieces of silver by the priests. We read about this in Leviticus 27.5. And the price for a mature male slave will become 30 pieces of silver, the same price that was paid to uh, Judas. In verse 29, it says, Now Reuben returned to the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, so he tore his garments. He returned to his brothers and said, The boy is not there. As for me, where am I to go? So they took Joseph's tunic and slaughtered a male goat and dipped the tunic in the blood. And they sent the very colored tunic and brought it to their father and said, We found this. Please examine it to see whether it is your son's tunic or not. Then he examined it and said, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn uh, to pieces. So Reuben, I guess, according to this verse, returns, so he wasn't there during that discussion. He returns to rescue Joseph. And when he sees he is missing, he is terribly grieved. As to the oldest, he's responsible, and now he doesn't know what he's going to tell his father concerning Joseph. You know, he thought that what he was going to tell his father is, look, I rescued him, he's safe, he's sound, or maybe make a deal with Joseph and say, look, if you say nothing, we'll go to dad, and that'll be the end of that. You know, we won't even talk about this anymore. But now his plan is, of course, upset by what they have, uh, what they have done, and he doesn't know what he's going to do uh, to tell his father about uh, Joseph being missing. So the plan is to bring back Joseph's coat, soaked in blood, and allow Jacob to draw his own conclusions, which he does. He's worried, he doesn't question them, not even about the fact that the coat itself is not torn or there's no sign of a body. In verse 34 it says, So Jacob tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned his son many days. Then all of his sons and all of his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, Surely I will go down to Sheol in mourning for my son. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, Pharaoh's officer, the captain of the bodyguard. So Jacob's response was total and unconsolable grief. Let's face it, he had lost his beloved Rachel only a few years before. Now Joseph, his favorite son by Rachel, had been killed. And he also feared for the promise, because without Joseph there seemed to be none of his sons who could carry on the spiritual leadership in the family. He was always thinking about that promise being carried on from generation to generation, and Joseph seemed to be the son you know, primed and able to carry on uh, the promise for the, next, uh, for the next generation. So of course his sons and daughters eventually became worried because he was intent on mourning until he died, and he could, so he could be with his dead son. That's the idea. I'll keep mourning till I die so I can be with him. This was, of course, hypocritical on their part, considering what they had done. I mean, they knew what they had done. They were trying to console their father uh, because of Joseph's death. And so Joseph, the Bible tells us, was eventually sold to Potiphar. Now, the term uh, officer, it says Pharaoh's officer. The term officer is the Hebrew word for saris, which means eunuch. Uh, and this may explain the motivation of uh, Potiphar's wife to have sex with uh, Joseph, as we uh, later find out. Potiphar uh, was also captain of the guard, which entailed the gruesome job of being the king's official uh, executor, uh, executioner, rather, uh, as well. So this chapter ends with Joseph now uh, uh, beginning a new life in Egypt as God's plan for him begins to unfold. Of course, we know the story, don't we? And we know the ending and so on and so forth. But uh, if, if you didn't know the ending, you would be thinking, wow, 
the family's in trouble. Uh, Jacob has you know, uh, lost his favorite son. And the promise that God has made, it doesn't look very good that it'll be completed by this particular family. If we don't know the rest, right here is pretty much the low point as far as hoping that God's promise be fulfilled through uh, Israel. Uh, it doesn't look very good for that happening. All right, so we're going to stop there and maybe draw a couple of lessons from uh, this uh, story, this episode in Jacob's life. Lesson number one, be careful how you use your spiritual gifts. You know, Joseph was obviously a favorite son and had many talents, and his dreams demonstrated that God wanted to use him in special ways. But because of his youth, Joseph allowed these things you know, to go to his head and became arrogant rather than being humbled by his gifts. You know, you're given a great gift by God. It should have the, it should have the effect of humbling you that God has given you this thing, you feel responsible. You see that in people all the time, don't you? Great athletes, artists, whatever, many of them feel humbled by the opportunity and the gifts that they've been given. Now, what Joseph should have done was to go to God in prayer for greater understanding and direction, you know, to say, God, what does this mean? What, what does this dream mean? What do you want from me? Or at least he should have sought out his father's advice in private. You know, to, to, to say, you've had dreams from the Lord. You know, I've had a dream now. I don't understand it. You know? But he didn't do that. Instead, he showed off, plain and simple. He was just showing off and he paid the price for his pride. Now, in the New Testament, we see the same type of thing in the Corinthian church, for example. If you've read that epistle by Paul, where this young church who is young in the faith but they're blessed with great spiritual gifts, but they use them to do what? They use their great spiritual gifts of you know, speaking in tongues or prophecy, healing, whatever. You know. They use them to show off or to compete with each other for preeminence in the church. Uh, kind of the same thing that Joseph was doing, showing off his dreams to demonstrate that perhaps God had chosen him to be preeminent among his brothers, not only his brothers, but his brothers and his parents. So we need to remember that whatever gifts we have in the church, and of course in Romans 12, Paul talks about uh, the gifts that God gives people in the church, you know, the gift of preaching or teaching, serving in some way with a skill of some kind, uh, leadership ability, counseling, benevolence, or the ability to make and, and be generous with uh, money and resources to help the church, all these things are gifts. And these gifts, as well as the miraculous gifts that were given in the first century, all of these were given with two purposes in mind. The first was to honor and to serve God in some way with one's gift. And the other was to serve others in the church to build up the kingdom with the particular gift that we had. You know, sometimes our prayer is for God to reveal to us what our gift is. You know, Lord, let me know how I can serve. Let me know what I'm good at. You know, give me something that I can use to honor you. And sometimes it's to help find a way to use our gift. You know, we're asking God, let me, you know, give me opportunities to preach or to teach or to share or to serve. But, um, but it's never for our own glory. That's the point I'm trying to make here. We have been given gifts and sometimes we haven't figured out how to use it exactly or we have opportunities to use it, but it's never been given to us so that we can bring honor to ourselves or glory to ourselves. Uh, Mozart, for example, the great composer and pianist, uh, Mozart, he had a great gift of musical genius, truly a musical genius, but he spent it on himself in a, in a wasted life. And, and, and on the other hand, you have a, another musical genius, Beethoven. He also had the same genius, but on every sheet of music he would inscribe, to God be the glory, because his genius, he understood, uh, outstripped anything that other humans and other musicians had, was certainly a gift from God, and it humbled him. He wanted to be reminded always that what he had was from, was from God. Uh, lesson number two. Um, we all need refinement, just in case we're getting a little discouraged here. We all need refinement. You know, Joseph had the gift of prophecy and the ability to inter uh, dreams, but God had to work on his character before he could become useful to him with that gift. Yeah, he had the gift, 
but God had to refine him so he could you know, use it without you know, alienating people. His suffering refined his spirit to where he trusted in God, humbled himself, and eventually forgave and loved his brothers. So Joseph took a long you know, emotional and uh, uh, attitude trip there from, from resenting perhaps and you know, perhaps even hating, being angry at his brothers to actually forgiving them for what, they, for what they did to him. So his experience is a lot like our own in that much of what happens to us is used by God to refine us and purify our character and prepare us for service here on earth and to prepare us for life in heaven as well. You know, if there was no God, we could, we could curse our luck for illness or adversity. But because there is a God who knows and acts and is in charge, we can trust that God causes all things to work together for good. You know that passage in Romans 8, verse 28. We often you know, recite that passage. God causes all things to work for good. Well, yes, God causes. In other words, He makes all good and bad things equal good eventually for those who believe. So if you're a believer, no matter, no matter what happens in your life, whether it's good or bad, God takes the good and the bad together and He makes something good happen to it eventually. Good for His purpose, not your purpose, His purpose. That's the thing we sometimes forget. We're always thinking, where's the good? I don't see the advantage for me. God is supposed to make all things work for good for me. Well, no, it's not for you. It's good for Him. You know, all things work for good for Him, right? All the good stuff and all the bad stuff in my life, God can use it for His purpose. And I'm, and I'm grateful for that because I want Him to use me and I realize in my life it's not all good. Sometimes there's failure there or it's not as good as I would like it to be and it's not as good as I would want it to be. The promise is that God's going to use it all. Why? Because I believe and I trust in Him and I offer Him whatever I have day by day by day. And then one other lesson, uh, sometimes you have to stand up for right. That's pretty obvious, isn't it, in a situation like that. Reuben's problem, of course, he was the oldest. He was supposed to be the leader, but he was soft. Instead of finding his own wife, for example, what did he do? He took the woman that was closest to him, his father's concubine. Uh, instead of standing up to his brothers and claiming his rightful authority as the oldest and denounce the deed that they were about to do as wrong, he tried to devise a kind of a sneaky plan to save Joseph, you know, to do both. Now, I won't get my other brothers mad at me and at the same time I'll save my younger brother. You know? Instead of standing up and saying, no, you know, over my dead body, you kill him, you, know, you better kill me too. So his inability to stand up cost him his blessing and the chance to redeem himself with his father by saving Joseph. Could you imagine if he had brought Joseph back and saved him? Uh, perhaps the history of how the promise you know, was, was, uh, uh, was eventually given to the future generations, that may, may have been a different story, but he didn't, he didn't do it. So negotiating and compromising diplomatically is important and necessary. But sometimes, especially when it comes to what's right according to God, you just have to draw the line and stand up for what's right. And you have to do that sometimes in your own home or in the church or you know, at work or whatever. Sometimes you just, you just have to stand up what's right. And, and, and I have to say, if, if God's people will not stand up for what's right, well then who will? You know, who will? It's a shameful thing that sometimes people who don't believe in God work harder at, 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 at curing society's ills than, than God's own people do. But that's a subject for another time. All right, so that's the end of our lesson, the beginning of the end. The story of Joseph will continue that next time we meet. Thank you very much for your attention.